remains to introduce Kate um, Rayworth, who doesn't really need much introducing to I suspect many people in the room, um, self-described on your website as a renegade economist. Uh, I don't know if somebody else came up with that word and you said, that's a good word, I'll live with that. Or you came up with yourself, it's, that's, that's the more plausible, and my hypothesis has been confirmed. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's a good framing for what Kate does. I see her work as in a long line of, uh, of really encapsulating a long line of ecological economics work, of embedding how we think about the economy in the, work, the, the, the material world that we all live in and depend upon. Um, and she's encapsulated that with the concept of donor e economics, which she's going to talk us about just today. Has a you know massive best-selling book, um, which is rare for people working in this field, but it's a genuine bestseller, um, uh, which is something. And then an organisation also to mobilise those ideas in specific contexts, which is particularly impressive to be able to do both of those things. I think um, she has a position at uh, the University of Oxford um, and at Amsterdam, um, uh, as well as uh, focus on her own organisations, don't economics. Um, and before that, she had a long career uh, at Oxfam. Um, I think that's enough by way of introduction. She can uh, speak for herself very uh, capably, I should think. I will then just briefly, because it's the next slide and otherwise you'll press the slide and it won't be yours. Um, when we get to the panel, uh, oh, there was another one. Oh no, we've, we've taken that out. Um, there, was, there was a slide in an earlier version with Helen Holmes, who's a lecturer in sociology uh, and works within the Institute on questions of everyday life and changes in practice and sustainability. Julie Froud, who's a professor in the business school, um, uh, and uh, Stefan Bozorowski, who's a professor of geography. Uh, and they're going to be uh, providing part of the panel commentary discussion after Kate's talk. Kate, I will hand over to you. I'm on a train and I'm in Manchester and I'm really delighted to be here with you. Um, I'm so, look, I fit the decor, I feel like I just went on. <laughs> I did call ahead, come see. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about can we live in the donor? And I have to say for any medics in the room, the health and safety, the only donuts that are good for us are conceptual, this is it, don't eat the things. Um, and the work I'm showing here is from the, the, the organization I've co-founded called Donut Economics Action Lab, which is all about putting the ideas of the book I wrote in 2017 into practice, because what happened was when this book came out, people just started coming up and saying, I love the ideas and I'm doing it. I'm a teacher, I'm bringing it in the classroom. I'm a community organizer, I'm taking this into my next community meeting. I'm a town councillor. I'm, I'm a mayor, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a graduate and I've just joined this big company and I'm taking it in the boardroom. And I was blown away by people actually wanting to do this. So what I'm gonna show you are the concept of donor economics, but then put into practice. How do we apply that? What does it look like when you actually start trying to do it? So I'm gonna start with where I began, which was economics. I studied politics, philosophy and economics at Oxford University 30 years ago in the early 1990s. And I was really frustrated by what I was taught because the things I cared about, like environmental integrity and social justice, were just at the margins of the syllabus. And that's not specific to Oxford. I believe that's been true of economics education the world over. And I believe it's still far too true of economics education the world over. So this is my comeback at economics, where I began. And I think I'm going to give you, oh, who, who in this room has ever studied any economics of any kind? Just put your hand up. Okay, great. Lots of people. So for anybody who didn't, who, who never studied economics and can't believe you come to the lecture with this. <laughs> I heard this works for everybody. So, okay, let me try this. If you studied economics, what's the first diagram you remember learning? Thank you very much. It's the same answer, the world over. That's weird, isn't it? That's weird. I can't think of any other subject where you say, what's the first thing you remember learning? And you'd get the same answer. So there's something weird that it's so standardized the world over. So I'm gonna give us a crash course in what I call 20th century economics, the big ideas that really dominated us and they're so profound and big that we often don't realize we've taken them on board. They've gone into the back of our heads. So the first one is the first thing that you learn. It's just learned month. 
Now, what that immediately does is say, welcome to economics, ethos, nomos, the art of household management, but we're just going to go straight in with the market. Well, that's a choice, isn't it? I mean, that's not just obvious, that's a choice. Welcome to the art of household management, here is the market. And it puts price at the center of our vision, right? That becomes suddenly the metric that we're talking about. That's a choice. And it means that anything that falls outside the market contract is called an externality. And when you find yourself talking about acid rain, as it was when I was a student, or the hole in the ozone layer, or climate breakdown, or the ongoing death of the living world, and you're told, well, yes, we talk about these as environmental externalities. I mean, for me, that's reason enough for transformation. If aliens want to destroy life on Earth, they do not need to invade. They merely need to convince ourselves that the best way to describe any impacts that we might have upon the living planet on which we depend as an environmental externality, and the job is done. So there's a the problem. The selfie, the portrait of humanity, is, of course, rational economic man. I'm just going to pull this so I can see it. Oh, no, it doesn't come here. The portrait is rationally coming now. He's never drawn in the textbooks because I came quite obsessed with the power of pictures. I drew him and he'd have to look a bit like this. He'd be a man, no dependence. He's standing alone, independent of judgment. He's got money in his hand. That's how he interacts with the world. He's got ego in his heart, self-interest. He's got calculator in his head. You think it's funny. He's got nature in his feet. Somebody gasped. I like that. <laughs> He's got nature to speak. He hates work. He loves luxury. He knows the price of everything. And these are the traits ascribed to the models of humanity. And the problem with them is not just how absurdly narrow it is. The problem with them, as people like Robert Frank and others have found, is that the more that students learn and are told that he is like us, we become like him. From year one to year two to year three, students more say they value self-interest and competition as characteristics in the economy rather than altruism and collaboration. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. And that matters for every single social science because how we describe ourselves remakes us. If we're gonna thrive 10 billion people on this planet, then telling ourselves that this is who we are, I believe gives us no chance. We need a new portrait. And then the goal, what's the goal? I, I remember that moment of realizing I'd never had that moment of discussion in all my economics education of what was this for. We didn't talk about it because it was implicit. The goal was endless economic growth. And the curve is never even drawn in the books because it's so innately embedded that growth, if you have a growing economy, that is the mark of success. It's so deeply embedded. So these three images, I think, go deep into our heads and sit in the back in your visual cortex and they shape what we see and what we don't see, what we put at the center, what we leave at the periphery. And that matters for everything that then gets left out. I'm gonna add two more. I think just as Isaac Newton discovered the physical laws of motion, economists have wanted knowingly or not to discover the economic laws of motion. And there are two apparent laws that massively have shaped policymaking over the second half of the 20th century and still today. And the first is the story around inequality, and it's the Kuznets curve, right? So back in the 50s, Simon Kuznets looked at data from the UK, the US, and Germany. What happens over time as countries get richer? He found inequality first increases, and then it decreases. And if you read Kuznets, he says, that's weird. I wasn't expecting that. I thought the rich would get richer, not that the poor would catch up. And he, he, he says, I've got 5% empirical evidence. 95% speculation and probably some wishful thinking. Those are his words. And it wouldn't it be a pity if this became uh, a dogmatic generalization? Poor Simon Kuznets, because that's exactly what happened. By the time this curve got drawn by others, it whispers out this message that if, if you care about inequality, don't, don't regulate and redistribute. You see, you may get in the way of growth and growth evens things up again. And it was Thomas Piketty who came along in 2014. He looked back at the data. He said, well, actually, Kuznets was right. That's what the data from those countries at that time showed. But he was also right that he was looking at an anomalous period. This was from pre-war to post-war. And war destroys the wealth of the, uh, the capital of the wealthy. And post-war governments invest in health and education and housing. So it was war that bent that curve down, not the inherent workings of the market, but the message has a very, very long tail of policy influence. And we still hear it today in austerity, in tightening your belt, in leveling up and trickle down. Then the other one, in the 1990s, economists started looking at data on 
uh, pollution levels, local air and water pollutants in countries of different income levels. And they said, we think we see a pattern. It looks so familiar. We're just going to call it the environmental coastlets curve. That it looks like over time, as countries get richer, first pollution increases, but then it decreases. So if you care about the environment, don't regulate, because you see, you might get in the way of growth. And growth, like a well-trained child, cleans up after itself. <laughs> Except it doesn't, and they don't either. It doesn't because when we they didn't have global data, they had and they said we only have local air and water pollutants. Well, we now have more. We have global data on material footprints, on it, on carbon footprints, and that curve does not bend down automatically at all. In fact, it takes a lot of effort, even just to make it start to flatten off. So these two apparent economic laws of motion have massively influenced policymaking. Grow now, clean up later. We need to debunk these and replace them with something that actually makes sense and actually is, is fit for these times. So that theory, I believe, has fed into how the 21st century has actually begun with repeated crises. From the financial meltdown, which kicked off the post-crash economic society in this university, kudos to them, which has led to climate and ecological breakdown, which has led to really interesting a crackdown now on protest Seven women now about to be sentenced to jail for smashing the windows of Barclays Bank, the biggest funder of fossil fuels, and crackdowns on protests all over the world, and then two years of COVID lockdown. Now, these, these disruptions, these crises, they, they arise, and they're reported differently in the papers, but I think they've got deep connections in their roots. They show us how connected we are with each other and the rest of the living world. They hit people with vast inequalities of gender, of race, of global north and global south of wealth and power. And they arise from systems based on endless expansion. So a financial system that aims to endless expand will kick off its own bubble. A resource system that repeatedly takes energy and material resources from the earth will induce climate and ecological breakdown. And a system of settlements that's endlessly pushing out into areas of wildlife, creating zoonotic disease transfer coupled with ever increasing global flights creates perfect conditions for a pandemic. So I believe that embedded in the economic systems we've created of endless expansion lies these repeated crises. Is there another way? Is there another vision, another framing that we can give ourselves that gives us a chance, not of running endlessly into what Kim Stanley Robinson called the turbulent 20s where we are now, but actually of thriving. So this is where I want to propose a donut, the only one that is good for us. What's going on here? If you imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the center of that picture, then the hole in the middle is a place where people are falling short on the essentials of life. It's where people do not have health and education, housing, energy, transport, community, political voice, income, social justice. And these are crowdsourced from the world's government. <laughs> They come from the social priorities set out in the Sustainable Development Goals. The reason and power of doing that is that when you present this to the world's governments, you can say, whose values are these? They are yours. I crowdsource them from you. All the governments in the world have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim not to live in the hole of the donut. That's powerful. But we know that as we seek to meet our needs and wants, as we get over that social foundation into the green ring and then some beyond, we put pressure on the life support systems of our planetary home. We use, we cut down forests, we emit, emit carbon, we convert land, we take water for irrigation. And we start putting pressure on this ecological ceiling that we start to go beyond. And this is the nine planetary boundaries recognized in 2009 by earth system scientists like Johan Rockström, Will Stefan, and about 28 others. They said, these we believe are the life supporting systems of planet earth. Just as our bodies have a skeletal system, a digestive system, a respiratory system, a muscular system, nervous system, and you can only put so much pressure on any one of these before it collapses and tips you out of health to ill health or death. So too, the planet has a set of interdependent balanced systems, delicately balanced, and there's a limit of pressure we believe it's feasible to put on any one of these systems before we go into a complete zone of uncertainty and real risk of tipping points. So these are the nine planetary boundaries. So that makes a donut. Leave no one in the hole. Don't overshoot the limits. We want to thrive in the space in between. And it's a completely different shape of progress. Literally the shape 
than that line of endless growth that economics teaches us. And I was fascinated when I first published this as a discussion paper at Oxfam, here's an idea, it immediately had traction. I was amazed by just the shape. I mean, you take all those words and imagine writing those words in a list. I don't think anyone would really, really blink. So what is it about shape that changes how we think? And I think there's a huge, interesting area of research around cognitive framing. Like George Lakoff writes a lot about verbal framing. And to me, this is visual framing. How do we draw? And it made me, when, when that happened, I thought, well, what are all the pictures I've been taught? And how they shape how I and all other economists have been trained to think. And when I ask myself, if this is a shape of well-being, it, it's, it's like thriving between these two, right? It's like a heartbeat between the two boundaries. And I looked at how other cultures have depicted health or well-being or thriving or balance. I was astounded to see just again and again and again the, the sense of a, a dynamic circle, this dynamism within a circular shape. And there's something profound that other cultures have known for millennia in some cases. And then I started to think of the donut as like a, a Western recovery program, like right? it's a, a Western mindset recovery program towards something that other cultures have long known, that we need to find our own way there through concepts that we can evolve our way towards something that's there and growth right the idea of endless growth suddenly looks like a really strange outlier so how can we move from thinking that's the shape of progress to actually this balance because if that is the shape of progress we're really far from it right now this is the global donut the state of humanity in the living world billions of people falling short on the essentials of life all of that red in the hole in the middle if i show you for example here food that red wedge goes 11% of the way to the center of the circle, because 11% of people don't have enough food to eat every day. Some of these have two because we meant red energy, for example, percentage of people who don't have access to electricity, and percentage of people who don't have access to clean cooking sources. But on every one of those social dimensions, there are billions of people falling short, many of them in low income countries, some of them in the center of our own cities, if we, if we walk out and see deprivation in the midst of plenty. And at the same time as that, we are massively overshooting planetary boundaries. If I give you one example, the carbon one, the ceiling is set at 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide. If you've ever heard of that campaign group, 350.org, it's that 350. But we're way over 400 parts per million. So we need to come back within all of these. And all of these ecological, that they're set in terms of nature's own metrics. This is not financial. The only mention of money here is income and work. People living below a minimum income level. Everything else is measured in human and natural metrics. So that's our state, our selfie of us now. To me, this is the, the, the turnaround picture. Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And it asks each one of us in whatever we do, what do we now do to start turning the story around? I believe our children and grandchildren will ask us, and so then what did you do? Once you saw this, what did you do to be, be part of the team that actually starts going in a direction we've never been in before? And last century economic theories that are still being taught, last century's government policies, last century's business models, last century's lifestyles, none of them were dissolved, none of them were designed to solve this. Dissolved, yeah, maybe they could be dissolved. There's a new Freudian thing. They will be dissolved. And they will be replaced with new economic theories and government policies and business models and lifestyles that are designed precisely to tackle both of these sides at the same time. Now, this is a global picture, but most policy making and, and change happens more locally. So let's go in a minute, go down there. Here's some headlines that tell us that story of the planetary boundaries. Um, in the words of William S. Burroughs, US writer, any, any visitor from outer space taking one look of Earth would say, I want to see the manager. <laughs> Who do we go to? Who's the manager, right? That's the ecological breakdown. I do like the, the, the headline up here, NASA. NASA, holding now token there, finally closing up because humans did something about it. That's the point. We can do something about all of this. But then let's go inside. This is a very recent headline, right? We felt it and seen it. Water and energy shortages are fuel, fueling a global food crisis. And the richest 1% of people own half the world's wealth. 
That's the stat I find hardest to actually get into my head. The richest 1% of people own half the world's wealth. So when people say to me, well, could we really ever live in the donut? I think, well, hang on, we're starting from an extraordinarily skewed, distorted place. There's a lot of play possibility here to turn this around. So let's go down to some national donuts. So one end we've got Malawi, a lot of red in the middle because there's a lot of human deprivation, people falling short on their most essential needs, and they haven't overshot any of their share of pressure on those planetary boundaries. We've got China, a double whammy of both shortfall and overshoot. Now, let's come over to here to the US. You've got inequality, that's what's the red on the inside, right? Very high income country. So Kuznets curve, the richer you get, the more it evens up, not so, not always so at all. Massive ecological overshoot. And then I put Denmark there because people say, oh, but the Scandinavian. Oh, they've sorted it. And even the Scandinavians say, oh, but the Scandinavian. I love showing Denmark, Norway, Sweden, in Scandinavian or Scandinavian or this is the chin kind of goes, Draw, oh my God, is that what we look like? Because yes, the circle is blue. They, against, compared to most other countries, Netherlands and Denmark fulfill the basics of social meet needs, but they have huge ecological overshoots. Now let's put these on a chart, right? So the place you want to be is that sort of sudden reflect corner. So as you go up, that's meeting the needs of all people, reducing the number of people who are falling short. And as you go that way, you're coming back and back and back within planetary boundaries. So the first thing to notice here is there's no country that's in the sweet spot. There's not a single country in the world right now that is, as far as we know, meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. Who's closest? Costa Rica. Second, the countries that we usually go around calling developed countries, they're way out here, right? So I invite all of us, next time you hear yourself or hear somebody say developed countries, say, well, should we just... Ask that again. I, I can't think of a single country in the world that has the right to call itself developed or advanced. There's nothing developed or advanced about overshooting planetary boundaries to break down the life support systems of our planetary home. And, and our Scandinavians are here. There's Norway, Sweden, so Denmark, and the Netherlands will be around here too, right? And then right out there on their own, the US, Canada, Australia. So these low income countries here, have to go on an unprecedented journey. How are they going to meet the needs of all of their people without overshooting planetary boundaries in the way that every nation before them has done? It's never been done before. How? How are those middle income countries like China, Bolivia, Turkey, Peru, Russia, Mexico, they've got a double whammy to meet people's needs for the first time and come back within planetary boundaries? That's never been done before. And then the high income countries up here, it's never been done before to come right back within planetary boundaries, sustaining a good life for all. So I think every country in this picture has to have a healthy dose of humility and ambition to how do we start going in a direction we've never been in. To me, this is the, the if ever we're gonna have a dashboard of the world, it's this kind of metric that starts telling us, are we transforming or not? And then, to add, let's recognize that these countries look like separated spots on a page, as if they have their own individual stories, and of course they don't. They're profoundly connected by issues of colonialism, by military power, by corporate power and trade and finance rules, by resource extraction, by the present and future impacts of climate change. So we need transformation within and between these nations. And to be very clear, you know, the, those big overshooting countries, all that red at the top, we know through climate attribution science is directly impacting not only people in those countries, but very significantly causing drought in these low income countries over here. These stories are profoundly interconnected. It's time to join the dots and, and show ourselves a picture of global progress that's so much richer like this, not just saying well, what's happening to GDP. This is the story that really determines life on planet Earth. So how? How can we turn the story around? And let's remember that growth doesn't simply even things up again. Growth doesn't clean up after itself. We can't rely on that. Those, those Kuznets curves turned out not to be true. They are not laws of economic motion at all. We need to create by design. For me, the biggest shift in my own thinking in writing down economics was discarding anything and noticing everything that had been called a law. What kind of law is it? The law of supply and demand really the law of diminishing returns 
These are not laws. It's actually, I think, a hangover from economics wanting to show it's a science as reputable as physics. And so aping after Newton's laws, I, I shifted away from that. I said, no, it's about design. It's about design. And let's design economic institutions and dynamics, recognizing the economy is complex. So we're not in control, but we can steward it and we can intervene with leverage points, thinking Donella Meadows. How can we design so that we actually become distributive and regenerative by design? So let me say a little bit about that. So we've inherited linear degenerative economic systems. We take our materials, make them in stuff we want, use it for one, throw it away. And that's what pushes us over planetary boundaries. And we need to turn them into regenerative systems so that resources aren't used up, they're used again and again and again. From biological materials, I'm delighted we're gonna be having food from uh, Open Kitchen Manchester, was it? So that's a great example at waste from one process becomes food for the next on that biological loop. And then on the technical loop, any technical materials like this clicker, indeed the seats, not that the wood is the biological, but the seats were on, the carpet were on, all of these materials, they won't biodegrade because we've transformed them in ways they won't biodegrade. So we have to mimic nature cycles. We have to refurbish and reuse and repurpose and repair and share and only ultimately recycle, but never throw away because there is no away. So how do we do that? What does that begin to look like? What does it look like at the level of agriculture? No longer degrading landscapes, but actually restoring and regenerating. And, and thank goodness nature is generous. And before we push her over a certain capacity, she, she generously comes back when we give her the chance. What happens in manufacturing if we're no longer throwing e-waste in the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people, but actually repairing. So this clicker should be open and modular by design so that if it stops working, we can take it apart and actually get just the one piece that needs to be changed and repair that rather than chuck it away and buy a whole new one. And there are cities, look at this, this is not Photoshop, this is real in, in Seoul, in Korea, taking a 10 lane highway, take that out and put in, put back a river and think of the, the impact on city life, so many different levels that that has. And then coming all the way down to the level of a hospital, where would you rather get better? In this UK hospital, not a stitch of nature in sight, or in this hospital in Singapore, knowing that humanity heals far faster when we actually can see nature around us. So how do we bring ecological generosity back into our cities and designs at every level? So that's half the story. We've also inherited economies, because we were told that the growth would even things up and it don't. We've inherited economies that are divisive by design. They capture value and opportunity in the hands of a few, whether through regulation, through inheritance, through privilege, through power, right? And we see the rise of the 1%. And there's no chance of getting into the, into the donut in a world in which the richest 1% of people own half the world's wealth. We have to create economies that are far more distributive of value and opportunity. So they are sharing in an in in ecosystem through which value is flowing far more equitably. So what could that look like? Uh, just a couple of examples. Housing, for example, London, and I'm sure here in Manchester and many cities in the UK, housing is treated as an investment asset. But so you've got people, you've got this, this extraordinary anomaly of, of human rights to housing is literally pitched against the financial interest of pursuing the highest rate of return on an asset. And you've got those people pursuing the same piece of property for utterly different reasons. Whereas in the city of Vienna, over 60% of people live in social housing that's owned by the city or city-run co-ops. It's normal, it's affordable, it's central, it's good quality. Because decades ago, the city decided that housing is a human right and therefore would be owned and managed and designed in that interest. What if business, since we're in a business school, what if we throw away the idea that the 20th century norm that business is driven by profit and that's profit maximization is the, the standard pursuit of business. Why not make it purpose-led as this craft business in Mumbai is? And he's saying, the workers are my boss, I own my own factory, an employee-owned company. We can redesign business to pursue the very goals we want it to pursue. Yes, it needs to make a profit in order to open the doors next week and next month and next year, but that profit is in service of its purpose utterly open for redesign. And when I think of economics in these terms, I, I, get, I, I don't need to be a renegade anymore. I'm, I'm ready to be an economist if this is what it needs. 
when we put those two together and you start to get what happens if you have a regenerative and a distributive design, what would that look like? And I'm zoning in here to cities, as you can see, I'm going to talk about city practice, whether it's public transport in Amsterdam, or solar corps in Edinburgh, green job creation in Cleveland, the carbon social housing in Milan, and I'm sure there are many examples you can think of here in Manchester or in this region of projects, initiatives, policies that are both regenerative and distributive and policies that are degenerative and divisive, right? And how do we move towards these? How do we therefore make regulation and markets and the commons and lifestyles and business design in support of making this normal? So I'm gonna talk about how we actually started putting these ideas into practice. Uh, and at Donut Economics Action Lab, we work at three levels with uh, actually Frank, Frank Sometimes I say Frank Giels, and sometimes because you're here, I'm going to say Frank Reyes. Uh, your framework, your fantastic multi-level perspective framework. We work at the level of changing the narrative. We talk about thriving, not just growth. We work at the level of policy change, of working with key policy processes that are ongoing when people ask us to step in. But mostly we work with pioneers who approach us and say, we want to use these tools where we are. And cities and policymakers, city councillors, city mayors have come to us. And that's a real point of pride for us. We've never once gone to any mayor or councillor and said, please, please use these tools. Because there's enough ideas and tools out there. No one needs to be lobbied by somebody with another idea. We work with those who come to us and say, given the context we work in, given what we want to achieve, this looks like a useful tool to help us get there. And then we start working together. So I'm gonna to present to you the framework that we use. So how do you land these ideas actually in a place? So any city, and I invite you to think of whether it's this city we're in, or where you were born or live, or a city you love or hate, think of it through those lenses, the questions I'm gonna show you. How can our city help, the, help bring humanity into the donut? What would that look like for this place to be part of that transformation? Well, first of all, we unroll the donut so that we can go inside. We need some space between that social foundation and the ecological ceiling where we can explore and play. And then we turn it, oh, <laughs> that's conspiratorial. Uh, I don't think we can do much about that now. Too much to open up the ground. Here we are. We unroll it. And then we create this space where we can turn it into a canvas. So here's the question I invite you to ask this. How can your city be a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? I know that's a really complex question, and it's holding a lot. So we break it down. We break it down into what we call four lenses of doing the donut. So anybody who, who says, I want to take this donut concept and do it at a national level, a regional, district, city, neighborhood, town, village, this is the framework. And what you can see is we've got on one side local aspirations, and you'd feel those here. You'd feel what that feels like to live in this place. But it's also set next to global responsibilities, of the, because we know that every place is connected globally and therefore has impact on the whole planet and people worldwide and has to take that into account, even though it's not visible always where we are. So let's just dive in. So first of all, how can all the people of our city thrive? So this is classically the inside of the donut, right? These icons here about food, water, health, education, housing, connectivity, mobility, community, culture, income, equality and diversity, political voice, peace and justice. What would it mean for everybody in your city to be thriving? What, how is that defined? And that's gonna be different whether we're in Dar es Salaam or Dubai or in Copenhagen or Copacabana, and it's just gonna be defined by that place. So it's very much a local conversation of what that looks like. What are the targets that we have, has our city set targets? And, and where's the data? How are we doing against that? And where are the dep deprivations? And are they by district? Are they by gender? Are they by ethnicity, by age, by postcode? So what does it mean for everybody here to thrive? And then let's go up. How can our city be as generous as the wild land next door? Now, this question comes from the biomimicry thinker Janine Bennett. She'd say, if she were here with us, she'd say, OK, Manchester, take me to the nearest wild land next door. Take me to the healthy, natural habitat of this place where the closest possible, nothing's truly wild, so the closest possible to nature thriving in her own terms, where is that, where would that be? And let's go there together and let's see what nature's doing there. 
right? Because everywhere we go, nature has a genius for thriving. She's figured out in each place, whether at the top of a mountain or in a valley, in a wetland, in the tropics or the temperate zone, she knows how to sequester carbon there. She cleanses the air and stores groundwater after a storm. She houses biodiversity. She makes us feel at home. She cools the air from the treetops to the forest floor. So that's nature's performance. And if we were to go to the wildland next door, we could say nature is sequestering this much carbon here. This is how much groundwater she stores. This is how much biodiversity. She cools the air by five degrees from the top of the trees to the forest floor on a hot day. And those metrics become the metrics for this place. Can our city be designed not to have an urban heat island effect, but actually to cool the air by five degrees like nature does next door? Can we sequester as much carbon in our buildings as she does next door? Can we house wildlife as she does next door? What would that look like to design? So I love this because it's got this wildly ambitious but utterly natural metrics. Let's just aim to be as generous as nature. What would that look like? Again, design of our urban landscapes. So those are the local aspirations. And, and, and we could go to Denmark and Sweden and, and Norway and say, oh, coffee, great Wi-Fi, and everyone goes to excellent schools, and there's great healthcare, and everyone has high incomes, and there's very low inequality, and the, you can swim in the harbour, and there's forests, and the air is clean, and we think this is, you know, we've arrived. But that's just half of the story. That's just the local aspiration. We also have to look at the global responsibilities. So let's go here. How can our city respect the health of the whole planet? And now we're looking at those planetary boundaries, the outside of the donor. So let's just take this room and here we are. Think of all the food that everyone in this room's eaten today. Think of the clothes that we're all wearing. Think of all the electric equipment that's powering us, the synthetics and the materials. Think of the construction materials that went into building this building. Where did they all come from? A, be a teeny fraction came from the UK. So our footprint, carbon and material, is global. And so we need to take that into account. And so the outside of the donuts, those natural donuts, that's consumption-based accounting. That's showing our footprint on the whole planet. So how do we come back within those planetary boundaries? This is where all high-income countries are really in massive overshoot. How do we create circular economies? How do we decarbonize our economies? How do we come back within? How do we change our diet so that we massively reduce our take on the land and fertilizer and water? And then lastly, let me add to that, thinking still of the global supply chains that connect us to the planetary resources, think of how we're connected to people worldwide. Right? Who, who stitched my shirt? Who packed the food we ate today? Who dug the minerals that went into building these walls? Who assembled this clock and this, this computer? What are the labor rights for those people who make life good here? So how can our city respect the, the well-being of all people, whether it's in terms of labor rights, whether in terms of those facing the impacts of climate breakdown that we know that our high income lifestyles have caused significantly today. Whether it's people who are forced through many forms of circumstance to be refugees and they're arriving in our cities. What's that culture of welcome? What's the policy of welcome? How can universities like this one create solidarity through international scholarships? How can we use sport and culture and art to connect with and have solidarity with other countries? What else can cities and places do to ensure that the way they seek to live well respects the well-being of people worldwide? So those are the four lenses. And I know there's a lot there, but what's exciting is when we sit down at the table with policymakers from a city, everyone can find their, their thing, their entry point. I'm here about housing. I work on housing, there it is. Okay, I'm recognized. And now I can hear you because you work on climate change and I can now talk to you about net zero. And I work on social justice, but I work on fair trade in this city, and everyone can find their place. And it, it means they have a, a much more holistic conversation, rising out of the silos of you know, departmental job titles and actually looking at the connections across and between. So here's some examples of places that have actually used this framework. Amsterdam is the first. And in the height of COVID in April 2020, they published their city portrait that we co-created with them. And they said, we're gonna publish this anyway. This is our highest COVID infection month. But we're publishing this because we know that when we emerge from emergency, who are we going to become as we build back better, as we reboot? Are we going to go back where we came or actually we're going to move into the transformation we wanted already? They want to become a circular city. 
right? So they put the donut at the top of their strategy for being circular. So it's a holistic vision. They turned the donut Dutch orange. And, <laughs> and this is the vision for the city, a thriving, inclusive, regenerative city for all residents while respecting the planetary boundaries. I mean, I would love to live in a city whose policymakers said that is our goal. To hold them to account then as well for pursuing that goal. And they stuck, there we are, I love this thing. The city council created this diagram, a donut at the top, and it's got their circularity strategy underneath. So they're focusing on circularity through housing, through renovation, through uh, textiles, and lots of denim production. Who knew? The city of Amsterdam has a lot of denim. They want to be textile valley, not Silicon Valley, but textile valley. So they're looking at bringing together lots of small innovative de denim companies. Can we use and refurbish and repair and, and remake with denim and um, around agriculture and food? They've made a commitment to being 100% circular by 2050 and 50% circular by 2030, and to have 10% circularity in city procurement contracts from this year. So I really like that long-term total vision. That's the moonshot. 50% by 2030, wow, that's, that's soon and that's a lot. And 10% now, 10% contracts now for anyone who's ready to go with us. And that's the kind of targets that start to drive change. They also have a huge array of civic networks that simultaneously adopted the donut and said, actually, we're gonna create the Amsterdam Donut Coalition. And it's a lot of civil society organizations and initiatives and movements that already exist, but they said, this frame brings us together. We can see ourselves in it and it unites us. So they've been doing, they've got a fantastic website. This is the Amsterdam Donut Coalition website. If you wanna have a look at that, all the projects they've got going there. And they hold events like Donut Pioneers. There, there are weird moments like I was sitting on the stage and a Donut Pioneers and you what? <laughs> How did this ever happen? <laughs> Here we are talking about Amsterdam's Donut City and people don't love. Um, so Amsterdam, they, they raced ahead. Just a few train rides away is Leeds. So in the city of Leeds, um, Paul Chatterton at the university saw what was happening in Amsterdam and started working with university students to say, let's take the four lenses of the donut. And if each student does their master's dissertation on one of those lenses, we can put them together and create a city portrait. And we're very lucky because Katrina Roskorn, stick your hand up, go on. Right up, she's right here. So if you want to talk to her about that, that experience, she was one of the students who did her dissertation. Which was your lens? Local social lens. So, and they put them together and create and re-rolled it as, the Leeds donut. What I love about this is, first it was in the UK, yes, let's do this at home. But also it's, it's so much better than the one we originally did for Amsterdam. They've just done, they've, they've taken that, yep, got that, now let's add to the methodology. And it's that lovely thing of seeing places iterate and improve and build upon what happened before. So each city is learning from everything that's gone before and then doing the next. So this went up the next level. And then another few train stops away. Amazing work going on in Birmingham. If you want to bring it, say, okay, city, but that's too big. I want to do a district. Or actually, I just want to do a few streets. In Birmingham, this fantastic organization called Civic Square have been working literally at the neighborhood of a small ward, Ladywood, and Katrina has been working really, really close with them. If you want to know about that, I'll talk to her as well. In fact, tomorrow they're doing an online launch of their neighborhood donut portrait. So I would say to anyone in the world, if you're interested in what would it look like to do this at the neighbor with, as you can see, amazing creativity. These guys are really kicking ass and leading the way. Brilliant work. A little further afield in Barcelona, so the city council of Barcelona said, yeah, we want to use this concept as a tool. And they're doing both very intensive data. You can see them exactly the unrolled donut and the four lenses. They're collecting the data against their own uh, targets and they're making it a civic participation and, and engaging people with the concept. And then even a little bit further away in, in Bhutan, the government of Bhutan said, actually, we see a lot of correlation and connection between the concept of the donut and our concept of gross national happiness. So we want to see if we can use them together as part of creating our new regional plan for Timpu and Paro, which are the major cities in Bhutan. So we've been working with them. And we were online doing this webinar with them and they were in the room exploring the concept. So Nanaimo in Canada, the first place in Canada to adopt the framework using it, that they created their own compass and then using it to look at different policy options. Rather than cost benefit analysis, they're doing this sort of donut dashboard analysis. What should we do? Which one will help us move into the donut? And then Malaysia, um, Ipo wants to be the first city in Malaysia, in Asia, to um, engage with the donut. 
So moving quickly, here are cities and places all over the world, some led by governments, some led by the community that have so far approached us and said, we want to put this into practice. Many, many more educational and business and community groups, but these ones um, are the, the official ones. All of them say, if we want to transform here, we know we need to transform the systems of which we're a part. And here's the last idea I want to share. The deep design, back on, back on design, the deep design of places and institutions. So many city mayors said, you know, we, we were always told that we should make the city grow, that the GDP of the city was the, the metric of success, but we don't want to make our city grow. We want to make our city thrive. So what determines whether we are pursuing growth as an organization or whether we are pursuing thriving? And here we use a framework created by uh, an analyst called Marjorie Kelly, wrote a fantastic book called Owning Our Future about business design, but we've adapted it here for um, organizations as well. We look at the deep design of places and invite them in a workshop to look at their own deep design. So what is the purpose of your city? I mean, what is your goal? Amsterdam, I read out to you their new purpose. What is the purpose of this place? Has it been co-created by all? Are you, are you bringing in um, education and funding? Is it ambitious? What is your purpose? Who do you want to become? What are the networks you hold? All the different kinds of relationships. Are you creating strong enough relationships through deliberative democracy with your residents? Are you letting go of old relationships that hold you back? Are you in relation with other cities that have a similar ambition to you? How are you governed? Are you using experiment and piloting to actually bring about new change? Are you using citizens assemblies, for example, as a new form of governance? Are you helping people get out of their silos? And what other kind of governance is either pulling you back or propelling you forward? How are resources here owned? Who owns the sources of wealth creation in your city? Who owns the businesses? Who owns the water, the energy? Who owns the ideas? Who owns the data? How can a city enable a far wider form of ownership and ensure that public ownership means that universal basic goods are universally available and affordable <coughs> to all? And then lastly, finance. How can finance be put in support of your goals? How do you divest public pensions? Can you use public procurement? So these are the five deep designs that we explore with cities. And we create this canvas and say, look, there's, there's what's happening in your city. What's pulling you back from your own design or from national policies or indeed from the world? And they cover it in all sorts of red post-it notes of ah, all these things holding us back. It's very cathartic to get that all out. OK, that's what's holding us back. And what's already leading you forward from within your city, from within your nation, from within the world? And then they start to say, Actually, there's all these things that create openings for change that we can, we can move into. And then we work with them and say, what can you let go of and leave behind? And what can you start and spread and amplify? And this is just running that workshop in some of these cities. It's really important to position this because, of course, these cities are aiming to be utterly disruptive and transformative. And we have to recognize as part of that process that they are part of much, much bigger systems that don't want to let them change. And that are doing everything in the opposite direction. So we have to recognize that from within as part of that journey that we're on together. So any city or place, some, some of the many I've named, are going to be taking a long and winding road and yet it's urgent to getting the donut. And there are so many factors that are going to be disrupting or COVID or an election and in between. And this is the landscape that we're now working within. And I'd love any thoughts people have about how to hold accountability while recognizing that places face multiple crises and disruptions, how do we hold them and how do residents hold them to account for making progress on these goals? So let me pull right back. This is where we began. This was my 20th century economics education and I, I, I believe no student should be taught this thinking anymore. And yet it's still too much the starting point that we might deviate and critique, but we don't replace. We need to replace. We need to start with concepts that actually equip us to tackle the challenges of our own times. And I believe that a generation of teachers really owes that to the generation of students who are coming to university today. There is a real irony that students show up having paid very large fees for a course, finding that they actually now need to mobilize and re help rewrite the curriculum and, and organize it, right? And that's what the rethinking economics movement and the post-crash economics movement have experienced. So let's leave this behind. Let's start with ideas that actually equip us for the challenges. Let's put new first frames in our heads and see what then emerges and how we can design. And as I've tried to show today, some of the tools, very practical tools, and for us, we want to make them irresistible. 
so that they're understandable and accessible. And nobody says, oh, but I never studied economics. You don't need to. We can all understand this. We can all engage with these ideas. And actually, it's often much more political. It, it repoliticizes economics appropriately. And then people realize they've been having economic conversations all their lives. They just never understood and seen it or heard it framed that way. And now it's center to the story. So I welcome anybody to explore what we're doing at Donut Economics Action Lab. It began, as I said, from people just starting to play with donut in all sorts of crazy ways. We created a platform. It's the website donuteconomics.org. You're welcome to join or you're welcome simply to browse. You'll see lots of tools. The tools I've talked about today of bringing it down to place. It's called Donut Unrolled. And there's a whole set of tools you can use there. And since we're in a university, if you're interested, there's a set of academic dissertations that students have written using this frame. And there's a whole list of articles that people have taken the donut and actually used it as in academic exploration. So there's a rich academic literature that everyone is welcome to join. So I will stop there and I really look forward to hearing what the others have to say and to turn this into a conversation. Thank you so much. Well, um, thank you, Kate. I think that's the, the main thing to say. Uh, I, I feel sort of um, not quite sure how to capture it. Uh, I, I'm glad I'm asking some questions now rather than <laughs> having to respond. Um, that's a, a huge canvas uh, that we've just been given. Uh, and what we wanted to do also was then bring that into conversation with some of the research going on at the university uh, that connects in different ways. Um, I forgot to uh, um, tell the panel in what order I was going to ask some of these questions. So probably that Helen knows, I think, but I forgot to say to you. Um, so what we what what how, why why we've ended up with uh, the three three here is because they all I think intersect with are doing research that intersect with what Kate's just talked about in oh uh, in very different ways. And I want to start with Julie. Um, people will know, many people will know Julie in the business school. She's been part of a large group over the last 10, 15 years, um, developing the idea of a foundational economy, um, which clearly connects to the idea of a donut economy in interesting ways. So I want to ask, I actually want to ask two questions. One is to, to Julie, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. One is, what do you see as the key differences and points of connection between those two ideas? Uh, and and maybe a little bit about how you came up with the foundation on the idea and how that differs. The other thing I was struck by what Kate was saying at the beginning about the difficulty of changing economies. And so maybe a few reflections on the challenge of coming up with a new way of thinking about economics uh, and the economy and, and the pushback you occasionally get, well, uh, occasionally, definitely that's the pushback you get. Okay. Thank you. Much. I'm not sure why it says I'm from the collaborative research on aging. Oh, no, you're not my colleague. I haven't been looked at that. Anyway, first of all, thank you so much to Kate. It was a really inspiring um, presentation. So, really enjoyable. Thank you. So, I've, I've been working, as Matt says, on the idea of the foundational economy. And I guess, in a way, that's kind of what's inside your donut. That's the kind of, from, from my perspective, the foundational economy is the collection of. Um, systems, goods and services that we use every day, we often take for granted. So it's the kind of material things, housing, transport, food, energy. It's the, it's the providential things, the kind of care, education, health. And all of those things are massively important to, for our kind of, for our well-being. So that, that's kind of the focus. So it, it, it very strongly connects with kind of, you know, the, the kind of, the understanding of things. I think it, it, it shares a kind of starting point and, you know, a, a dissatisfaction with the way uh, we think about economic policy. So, for example, when we started thinking about this, there was the resurgence of industrial policy and strategy, but that was focused very much on the frontier, the exciting technological busy stuff, and completely ignored all of the everyday stuff that makes our lives kind of civilized, civilized and safe. And there's a sense then starting to think, well, how do we understand the economy as a collection of very different kinds of activities? 
some of which have been not only undervalued, but also kind of fragmented, underinvested, um, you know, sort of not working as we, you know, we laughed when we when we heard you come on the train because we all can't quite believe you can actually arrive anywhere <laughs> on the train. <laughs> but it's a kind of extreme version of how, how things don't work. So I think there's, there's, there's definitely a shared sort of starting point in the sort of dissatisfaction with the way we think about economic policy and a sort of the reprioritization of what matters. So what do, what do we need for well-being? What do we need for everyday livability? I guess a kind of interesting starting point was we very much focused on the kind of the now in terms of the, the problems is sort of now with the functioning of those systems and over time become in some foundational economy kind of groups become much more concerned with that kind of the future generations as well as the current generations and that's that's been you know i think an interesting development so i think that, that that's that's an interesting point of um contrast in terms of the, the, the what matters and the, and the what and how we need to change the way we think I think there are some differences in sort of, you know, the way, way of analyzing things. So for example, um, in sort of foundational economy approach has been thinking about different kind of levels. So one level is the household level, trying to understand what does livability look like in a household where clearly households are very different. And also try to think about sectors and systems. So within those different kinds of things which sit inside your donut, how do those systems work in terms of the business models? How would you go about understanding what's gone wrong and thinking about the possibilities for change? So some di differences, I think, in terms of, you know, sort of forms of analysis and thinking, but I think to, to um, come back to kind of think some interesting connections, which connects with your last point about the, the politics. I think there's a, there's, there's a key underlying question here, which is about, how do we learn how to do things differently? And I think this is a really massive challenge that sort of all alternative ways of thinking face. Um, and who, who are the kind of the relevant actors? I mean, I think I was interested in that, that Kate put a little emphasis on kind of local government and things. I think in sort of foundational economy can see that local government is a, you know, it's, it's not, not the problem, but I think it's, it's struggled through in the UK through a lot of austerity, a lot of de-skilling. And I think the question of how do you, find other actors how do you find other kinds of resources um, that can together kind of learn how to do things so a kind of culture of experimentation i think is really crucial in sort of learning so i think the, there's there's that kind of challenge that's really interesting in terms of the politics um, what to do about economics i think sort of ignore them and get on with it anyway <laughs> <laughs> no, nice flippant answer thank you Kate, do you want to come in on that? And apparently our microphone issues are, are continuing, so the simple folks oh. might need to try and use this one for a moment. I uh, know that sounded great, and I, I think there's huge connection between the foundational economy and the social foundation of donut. The name is even connected. <laughs> and I, I, I imagine if I could show more of the way we think about business models, or if I show the diagram <coughs> of the the economy having the market, the state, the household, and the commons in these four provisioning sectors, that they, we probably see a lot of commonalities. Um, and I was, yeah, there's always that choice of what should I talk about it, but so I talked about local governments and governments actually adopting the concept, but it doesn't mean that community organizations aren't doing it differently in as well. I, so I actually what I want to uh, focus on is the fact that I think it's really a rich time that there are different concepts. And it's really important to me not to create a kind of competition between them because that's the easiest thing to do. Oh, I'm your foundational economy, oh, well, I'm social guarantee, and I'm based in, and I'm going out there as well. Bye bye, see you on the other side, and there'll be no other side, right? And that's the easiest thing to do is to splinter and critique each other. And I think so it's, it's great to hear that. And, and different people will be drawn into different frames. Some people will say to me, I can't believe you called it the donut. And I think, well, I can't either, but there we go. <laughs> and for some people, actually, that makes it really accessible and they love it. And other people will never want to use that. And they'll say, no, I, I like foundational economy or, or just people come in at different points. And I think, I hope we're in a really rich time of conceptual evolution. Things evolve by diversifying, right? So you get many, many different names and frames of well-being economy, the donut economy, and, and, and there's a the future economy. <laughs> Let's, let's use them all. So it's, it's fantastic to hear that word's happening in the time. <laughs> <laughs> it is a future. Is it the future calling? <laughs> uh, no, no, everybody else is a future. I was just, just <laughs> the, um, 
I think the, the, the thing you said there about local governments is maybe a segue to, to, to sort of get Stefan to say, because Stefan works a lot on energy poverty in particular in urban contexts and part of a big team at Manchester, I see James Evans and the Ferris Office in the room as well, working on municipal climate action, municipal sustainability, and in particular in Stefan's case in the relation to questions of inequality and poverty. So I wondered, but, but I wondered, Stefan, in terms of the what what we got at the um, the sort of in the last third or so of the of the tour when the, these urban economic clubs, wonder how that resonates in relation to what 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 um, <coughs> other other ways of um, studying and acting in um, uh, questions of urban sustainability. Thank you. Do I need the mic? No, I think your mic's okay. All right, look great. It's just Kate. Um, Thank you. There's not going to be a phone call saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you for inviting me. And Kate, I just I found that astonishing. I've not heard you before live, and it was just such an inspiring talk. Um, I have to say, I was wondering what makes it so powerful, this metaphor, apart from it being a food metaphor, which always works, <laughs> I would say. I think it's also because it's a spatial metaphor. There's a, the donut, basically, is a spatial shape. That's also, you know, when I think of Frank's uh, multi-level um, framework, even though it isn't explicitly spatial, there's a spatiality to it that, that people like. And so that's the same here. And if I think of, I'm a human geographer, I should say, and particularly interested in political ecologies. We have a long tradition of urban political ecology thinking here at Manchester. So I'm basically trying to bring that into, particularly thinking around energy and urban governance and inequality. But I think it's that is that is that circularity, but also that boundedness that brings us into the urban space. And I think it, it was just um, incredible how you bring that into the urban space. I have to, I have three questions, and it's not so much about the value of the framework, which I think is incredible because it's got a heuristic and it's got a dialogic value. It allows us to engage. It's an engagement tool that's incredibly powerful. And I like what you said at the end. It's a politicizing tool because we've had so many metaphors particularly coming from social ecology, where those metaphors have been depoliticizing. They've moved us into a technocratic space where we've just talked about how about this, how about that, you know, that's what we need to do. People have been told what to do. This allows for that dialogue turn to the urban sphere. So it's not about that. I'm, I'm really interested in the processes through which things get defined, measured, and discussed. And there are three things I wanted to ask. So first of all, nature, and you said something about nature, there's this idea of nature being next to the city. How do we engage with nature in the city? Nature is, I mean, again, thinking through political ecologies, nature is everywhere, the city is nature. Um, we are right next to, not, people, not many people know, a covered riverbed, right next to this business school, there's a river that used to run here and there's actually on top of it, there's um, waste materials that were dumped and then there's grass on top of it, but, you know, that nature is there, and so we are of it and we're in it. So how does that engagement with nature in the city occur? And has that evolved in the process of defining those donut economies? Secondly, the question of sufficiency, which was in your second question. Um, in my energy engagement, so I, I find, for example, if we ask the question, how many people have access to electricity in the UK? Well, everyone has access to electricity, theoretically. But uh, just yesterday in the Independent, we, we had the news, 500,000 people have been handed notices by bailiffs to go on prepayment meters. There are about 10,000 just in Manchester. That's not really having access to electricity. So, um, you know, you could, come, you could go into a situation in the city where say, oh, we've got electricity, we've got energy, or we've got water, but we don't really. So the, the, meet, the, the politics of measurement becomes really important. So I wonder what's happened with that over the years and whether there's been any <laughs> tensions um, and politics and discussions and con conflicts and visions around that. And thirdly, what I would find again as a geographer is the politics of boundary setting. Um, so we, you talked about cities and those cities are administrative often. If, if I think about Manchester, right, Manchester is defined as, a, as an urban unit, but it organically sits within a greater metropolitan area, which again itself has, this, has very fuzzy boundaries. You could say it has 2.5 million people, but potentially more. 
the city of Manchester itself around 1 million maybe, nobody really knows. So if you work just with Manchester, not with Greater Manchester Combined Authority, you'll be missing out on that greater boundedness of the city. And then, of course, there are things that the city can do because they're beyond its boundaries. So again, that creates another politics. Um, and I'm sure that's the same whether you were in Amsterdam or in Leeds or in Lima, it's the same. So what has happened? What, how do people challenge and negotiate these boundaries? I know these are not questions that you can easily answer, but I, they are to me very central in terms of how we perform the donut when we bring it into what Logier would say, that politics of care at the everyday level. So I'd be really interested to hear. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Really, really questions. Okay. Um, okay, the first one. So I said, you said, um, I talked about nature next to the city. Yeah, I did. I and mean, I clearly wasn't clear. What I was meaning to say was, we need nature. There is nature in the city, and we need to uh, cultivate and regenerate the ecosystems of cities, right? Nature is within the city. But how do you know? How healthy, or what, how do you know what's possible in a city? So Janine Benyus would say, to find out what's possible, let's go to the wildland next door and let's see what nature does when we let her do it. And those become what she calls the ecological performance standards. So how much carbon is sequestered by the woods, how much it cools the air, how much groundwater it stores after storm. You literally, she, they have metrics and um, methodologies for going around literally measuring this. Okay, the wildland next door has these ecological performance standards. What if we set those as amazing aspiration for bringing and restoring and recovering nature in the city? So it's precisely to bring that connection. And if, if there's a, a covered over river like there was in Seoul, maybe it's time to uncover it, right? And that's what, I, as you sure you know, many cities are actually starting to do. This place wants to have a river in it. Let's let it come back. And then how do we work with that rather than design it away? So that's exactly the intention to bring nature back in the city. Uh, the second one was a great question about uh, electricity. You know, say we have a target, everybody in our city will have access to electricity. Okay, well, what would that really mean? How would we know? And that's when it really comes down to, first of all, locally defined meaning of what does it mean for everyone to have access to energy, what kind of energy, but also what kind of data are available and are they reliable? And that's when you don't want to only have the local council involved then you really want the, the, the community engagement and the, and the best places that are doing this are in bringing in the community saying, what does real access to energy look like here? And again, in the Civic Square, they've engaged people telling their stories, let's take photos, let's, what, what many kinds of data can we gather to show the reality of people? And that's why I said particularly that, that um, those two on that side, the, the local aspiration, this is a local conversation. This is locally defined. There's no, there's no indicator kit that comes with the tool from Donor Economics Action Labs and this will be your, it has to be locally defined because in Dar es Salaam or in Dubai, it would be a very different measure of what that is. And it's always, um, it, and then also, let me say, there's no one number. Right? I showed you that I don't know, one number. Well, there's no one metric for health or excess to energy. So there's also a real challenge of, well, how do we, how do we capture it in the most pertinent data? And, and we often say to places, what's most relevant where you are now? Um, in the US, in Philadelphia, I remember when they were looking at doing their health, they said, we're going to look at the percentage of, of people using opioids, because that's what's really prevalent now. And I was amazed, you know, and, and you, you started stepping into the local crises of places. So that metric may evolve and change. And again, we're learning this. We're, we're, we're seeing what happens when places start to use these tools. And then just to come to your, your third question um, about the boundary setting, really important point. So the framework setting up local and global sets up a very false binary. This is local and that's global. And global is literally everything that's not local. So it could be the village just outside and Cambodia. And there's something, right, there's something very crude about putting those together. So, We've sometimes said if, if it feels really important to say there's the city and then there's the our region or or, or our nation and the world and whatever what feels right for you. So the Secretary of State for Economic Transition in Brussels, a woman called Barbara Tracht, she got in touch when she was in Amsterdam. She said, I want to do this here. Should we do city centre of Brussels? Should we do Brussels capital region? We? we said, Well, there's no preset answer. What 
seems right for your place. And there's no one answer to that either. We learn, and Ellen Ostrom would say, well, it's polycentric governments, right? You want to look at the, the, the tiny neighborhood of Ladywood and Birmingham and the district of Birmingham and Birmingham and the region. And so we want this happening at many levels. So it's, it's messy and it's going to be fuzzy. And ultimately many bio, um, bioecologists would say, you should be doing it not at administrative boundaries, you should do it at the watershed level, right? And the bio, bio system boundary. So I'm hoping, um, actually there's one in North Carolina where they've done it at the, the watershed level. So we're beginning to see what happens when you do that. Really, really great questions that we're, we're working with every day. Thank you. Very instructive. The answers are very helpful, I think, to all of us working in neighboring spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brilliant, thank you. And finally, Helen. Uh, the, I mean, one thing that's implied, although not necessarily as much explicitly talked about because of the way that uh, Kate's presentation works, but it, it's obvious that enacting this involves huge amounts of change in daily practice in the, in house at all of those levels you talked about households, governments, workplaces, mm -hmm. etc. Um, and one of the things that I know Helen's been involved in, but lots of people in in SCI and that, in, in Manchester have been involved in thinking about how do those changes in practice work over time? What what determines whether or not people will change and how those things change? And how and what the interactions are between uh, individuals, infrastructure, technology, and so on. So I'm wondering, Helen, you want to say a bit about how how you would see that sort of question of the radical sort of a challenge Kate has laid down to us in terms of the, the dynamics of those questions of change in the life. <laughs> So yep. it's a small question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> uh, I've got the perils of going last, so I think there's a few crossovers with uh, Julie and Stefan have already uh, mentioned. But thanks uh, for that, Kate. Lots of lots of food for thought. Um, so I know you mentioned that change often happens locally, and I think that that segues with a big body of work within sociology in particular on the focus on everyday life. Uh, Matt mentioned practices. Um, and particularly at the SCI, we look at consumption and practices of sustainability. So I'm not a practice theorist. There are people at the SCI who are. So if this provokes any questions, I'll point you in the right direction later to who to ask. Um, but practice theory is very much, as a Rekovic Shatsky, is very much um, focused on how practices are embedded, how they're connected and how they're relational. <coughs> So they're embedded in social norms, in routines, in habit and habits, and, and also in much wider infrastructures. So I think to enable change, we need to think about those connections of practices. And I was thinking today about one sort of simple example is reusable coffee cups. So of course, you know, we're all trying hope that to be more sustainable. But in engaging in that practice, you need to buy the cup. You need to remember to bring it with you and probably many of us may be guilty of forgetting it on occasion. There needs to be access to be able to wash that cup. So that practice, that very small practice is embedded in a whole suite of other practices which are really important. So I think one of my questions maybe for you is, you mentioned incremental change. How do we go about changes? Do they have to be incremental? Because I'm thinking also about the recent sort of energy crisis which has actually forced changes amongst many households, which leads me sort of onto my next point. Um, and there was a report or statistic last week that apparently households in the UK are using 10% less energy since the prices have gone up. But then that also begs the question, doesn't it, of what are the impacts of, on that? You know, that's, those, there's some difficult choices being made there by people, I think. And that's sort of a forced change. And we saw that similar forced change with COVID and, and lockdown, obviously we've reversed many of those practices now, unfortunately. So if I'm coming at this from sociologically, you know, I think there's this um, really important work, isn't there, around recognising the voices and lived experiences of those who are marginalised, who are often unheard, um, and there's some great work being done at the Sustainable Consumption Institute at the minute, um, which is the, the TIES project, just to give it a little plug, but that's, that's doing some of that. Um, but then also that leads me on to my own research and the assumptions, and I know you mentioned this in, in the book as well, of the idea that actually people don't care. And there's this misconception that, you know, the majority of people actually don't, don't care about sustainability. Um, but my own research has shown that actually, again, another plug, one bit to rule the ball, that, um, that that just isn't true. You know, people do care and the majority of people want to do the right thing. Um, and, you know, reciprocity, sharing, circulating, 
have been features of society for centuries. You only have to look at the work of uh, Ray Powell um, to illuminate some of that. So I think one of my other things is if we're thinking about the sort of more incremental changes, how can we build on that um, and encourage it? And I, I know you had the uh, discussion there with, with Julia about the sort of this um, different economic um, alternatives being pitted against each other. And obviously we've got common in, we've got slow consumption, we've got community economies. And I think they can all learn from each other, can't they, in terms of encouraging those different changes. And then obviously I'm a sociologist, so I have to be a little bit critical. Um, my sort of final point is how do we remain aware of unintended consequences? Um, so a lot of my work's based on materials and objects. Um, I do a lot of work with the Sustainable Materials Innovation Hub here. We have many a conversation about um, initiatives uh, which propose to be circular, look great, and actually there are major environmental unintended consequences. A good example being the recycling of plastic bottles into textiles and clothing, which when that clothing is washed, and obviously we all wash our clothes a lot more than we actually need to, millions of microplastics are released into the system. Now that probably was never thought of before, you know, that particular idea was put forward, but how do, how do, we, how do we create these changes, but also being aware of, or trying to be aware of those unintended consequences? So sorry, some big questions back. <laughs> Great question. I'll, actually, I'll start with that last one. Um, so the planetary boundaries framework that I showed, which is the outside of the donut, I know uh, Johan Rockström and Will Steffen and others, they, one of the reasons they created it is because they said, as we try to tackle climate change, there's real risks that we disrupt other Earth system processes because we go all in for one, right? Everyone's like, net zero, it becomes this slogan, net zero, and we, and we fail to think about actually we're destroying biodiversity or we are massively using up water or converting that in the process. So the nine planetary boundaries are precisely to have a holistic framework so that as you aim to, to solve one, don't end up creating the other. So for example, the example you gave of plastic bottles, if you were looking at the planetary boundaries, you might say, oh yes, it looks like we're creating a circular economy, but hang on, if we understand enough about the material science of what's gonna happen, that's going to create plastic pollution, chemical pollution that will show up as a planetary boundary. That, that, was, that planetary boundary has recently been quantified actually in the massive overshoot because of plastics. So I hope, so of course there's always unintended consequences and there will be unintended consequences in places and ways we're using the donut framework. I hope that it's more holistic framing means that we'll catch some of those and they'll be <coughs> intended Preventions as opposed to unintended consequences. But it, uh, there's a quote from um, George Box who said, All models are wrong and some are useful. And I really live by that. And the donut is as wrong as any other model. It's not right, it's not true, it's not correct. It seems it may be useful for some of the things we intend to do in the world. And, there's, and we have to always know the, the point at which it isn't useful. So don't overextend it and overuse it. That's why I think it's really rich to have a, a multiple pluriverse of ideas, right? That, we, we never get obsessed with looking at the elephant from one angle. There's many angles and they're all valuable. So I would say that. And then the point about um, the, the cup. Yeah, we, I, I have a cup and I brought it today, but so many times I forget to bring it, right? But then we all have pens. I mean, that, you know, I bet there's something, who, who here forgot to bring a pen and ask somebody next to them for a pen? Nobody, okay, so we all managed to carry pens. I mean, in another parallel world, there could have been just like plastic pens dispensed as you walk in. And we'd say, well, we could never remember to bring a pen, but we do. So things do change and things we don't expect, you know, people think they need a car, but I think, well, I've never thought I needed to own my private train. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to share a train. So I do, I think it, 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 at some point, there won't be any paper cups. It's like, you didn't bring a cup, sorry. Uh, you have coffee tomorrow. I don't know, but, but, but I mean, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being flippant there, but of course the really important thing is before you edit out an option, and this is about social justice for sure, before you edit out an option, you edit in an affordable alternative. And you were talking to me about the trains, right? France has just banned flights that can be done within a two and a half hour train journey. So you edit in really good French transport before you ban the flights. You edit in affordable train journeys before you ban the others. Uh, I live in a neighbourhood in, in East Oxford where they've just introduced a, a low traffic neighbourhood, so they put bollards everywhere. There is so much tension and anger and fractures going on. We're becoming almost like this national story. It's that really funny thing where your tiny few streets become 
the story that's on the national news about fractious things going on in the neighborhood of Stockton. But you have to edit in car sharing clubs before you make it really difficult for people to own, to, to not own a car or, or ask people not to own a car. And you have to uh, edit in rural bus journeys. I know people who live in, in, in villages and say, well, it's really hard for me now. There isn't a reliable bus service. You need to edit in the affordable. And that's why public goods are so important. We can edit them in before we remove, remove the, what George Monbiot says, you know, we need to have public luxury and private sufficiency, not private luxury and public squalor. But you need to edit them in the right direction. Otherwise you get the yellow jacket response, the, the gilet jaune. Um, and you get the massive social injustice because the rich don't notice and the poor, poor can't cope. One of the um, <laughs> one, of, one of the unintended consequences of having really interesting people come and talk is that you run out of time <laughs> quicker than you think you might. I think if, if everybody's happy, we've got if we can take maybe one round of three quick questions from the audience. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we've, we've lost one of the microphones. So, Sam, you're on. So, the going to check shirt, uh, and then the woman in the middle with the blue hair, and, uh, and, and partly for convenience uh, and, and geographical uh, spatial questions. <laughs> okay, here, but, yeah. Thanks, guys. It's been absolutely brilliant. Sure. We'll take all three questions and then and then some response. Thank you. Yeah. Do, do you think this is going to be enough to edit donut economics in to cure capitalism? <laughs> <laughs> if we we go Sam, if we go this way, so we go to again use a you know, simple and then uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this amazing actually uh, talk. Uh, but I have quite uh, actually a big question, but I hope that uh, it will be answered. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD student who came from a totally isolated place from Gaza Strip from Palestine. So I was thinking about doing a study that tried to connect the SMEs in this isolated place in Palestine, which has uh, been as a, a conflict zone to the international global economic system to achieve economic development. But a, 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 do you think that, I, I will come back to the point that Stephen just uh, uh, has talking about, about we need a huge amount of politics and political uh, impact on, on any way of, of doing uh, economic development of SMEs involving to the international uh, global uh, economy. So how can we use the donut economics in, 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 this, in this area, in, in this isolated place that is in a conflict zone that needs to be developed and to be uh, uh, active, actually? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll play along, yeah. Thank you, that was a really inspiring talk. And um, my question is based on a really local event that happened, which is um, a tiny little community group called Trees Not Cars managed to prevent Manchester City Council from building a car park on the wing road because about 11, 12,000 residents asked for them not to be a new car park. Um, Extinction Rebellion supported them and sat in the space, and so it became a local news item, which was, which was brilliant. But it's now a kind of disputed space. And I was wondering how to make the leap into donut economics, because what the residents want is more green space, because we haven't got any where we live. Um, but what Manchester City Council wants and need as well, because we're a poor city we're kind of punished by the Tories for having a Labour government and our, our money's not being wasted it is being spent on you know health education social care all the rest of it it's not like they're you know it's not particularly being creamed off or anything so I can see why they need the cash how do we kind of balance those two things I realize that's a much more basic question than you've had so far <laughs> sorry about that but I just wondered what your insight was into that kind of local brilliant thank you you have a go, and then okay. if anybody wants to jump in, then okay. Let's. Let, no, I'm going to go in reverse order because they start very local and then go the whole big shebang. Um, so on that question about the car park, 
I suppose, uh, so first of all, what, what, is, what is the fundamental question here? We're trying to ask how should that local space be used for transport in Manchester? And, and we, could, we could take either of those at the entry point. That, those four lenses I showed, I would invite uh, a workshop that says, let's put at the center of that, let's say private car transport in Manchester or transport, and you put it in the center. And then you start asking, how does you know the building or not of this car park, how does it impact on the ability of local people to thrive? How does it impact on the local ecology? How does it impact on our global carbon emissions? And in what ways does it impact on people worldwide? Just thinking it through. <laughs> And again, this it won't, it don't, it can't, it won't give you the answer as to whether or not you should build a car, but obviously you, just, you should be freaked out if I told you it will give you the answer, right? <laughs> the point is it gives you a holistic framework to come up with your own answer and to make all the different issues more visible. So we hope that it creates a framework uh, that enables more different things to be seen at the same time by more people to take it into. So a really useful tool for deliberative democracy. And, and for people to listen to other perspectives that know that theirs are being heard. Uh, to the question about uh, SMEs in, in Gaza, amazing question, an amazing context. And uh, again, I'm, how could donut you, you can always be useful? So my first reply is I don't know. I don't know if it is or if it, how, and, and it will ultimately be up to someone like yourself to know, you know so much more about that context and, and what you need is a tool to say, actually, this looks like it could be useful. And here's how I adapt it, and here's how I've innovated it. And I would invite you to look at some of the examples on the on our website. There are it's been used in Barbados, it's been used in Chile, in Costa Rica, in 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 uh, places that are saying we're actually impacted by the global regime. Like it's not the question of how are we impacting on others, how are others impacting on us massively. And so it inverts the question in a really interesting way. And so if you said, I think this could be useful, then we would love to be in touch with you and say, how can we help you so that you use this? Because what you do will no doubt cause massive inspiration for others who say, oh, he's innovated something. I can see how that could apply where I am as well. And that's what's exciting about it. And we, we, I should just say, we put all these tools in the commons. We're funded by foundations. So we put all the work we do in the commons and we ask for commons reciprocity. So if you want, you can use these tools for free, we ask for reciprocity. If you make an innovation, please share back with others what you did, because that's the value to the community that we build shared value this way. So that would be amazing if you, if you said, actually, I can see this could be interesting. Um, and I'm going to say, have a conversation with Katrina, because she, more than anybody else, there, more than me, has thought about actually doing this work in a place, whether it's in City of Leeds or in this tiny neighborhood. In, uh, in in Birmingham, and so with her brain, I know it's going to be like, here's some things you can do. So talk to her. And then the question about capitalism, let's just kind of blow up with the whole big thing, right? Um, I never use isms, I almost never use isms, because if I if I had come in and said, you know, this is about capitalism, someone else would lose. Actually, when I went to the US, and I said, you know, talking about markets, and I said, you get to capitalism, you're a socialist, you're a communist. It's like, whoa, there are three boxes, which one do you want? <laughs> and it's so limiting. We, we talk past each other so quickly. So a very intention, as you can hear, I'm not talking about capitalism or socialism. But underlying this, I think that if we really went deep and if I was talking to you about the design of business through those same lenses, what is the purpose? How is it networked with its suppliers and customers, employees? How is your company governed? How is it owned? And therefore, with his finance, in service of, I mean, we can we can slowly bolt by bolt and screw by screw, unscrew the, the deep design of capitalism, and you can redesign business and redesign institutions. And it's a very interesting question. What kind of system is this then? I don't think we'd say it's capitalism. I don't think we'd say it's socialism. It's a, it's a new thing. And I think we need new spaces. And, and of course, many people say, well, of course, that's got many deep socialistic principles in it. But many other people will hear the word socialism and go, slam that. I'm not, did you see how that went wrong last time? So it's all about how the language lands. Um, I do have, I didn't bring it with me today, I do have actually a black shoe box that says capitalism on top because it's my black box of capitalism. And I love it. I love opening it. So what's inside the black box of capitalism? I am going to make a video called Unboxing Capitalism. <laughs> and I will make a little pitch for a book that I'm reading at the moment, which is. I'm always searching whenever people talk about capitalism. I'm like, tell me what you mean. Tell me what you mean. We're going to use this word like, tell me what you mean, so we can actually pick it apart. And so many people, so many courses being run at the moment, rethinking capitalism, reimagining capitalism. They don't define it. They just they say, well, of course, they're going to be capitalism. 
I'm reading a great book by Nancy Fraser called Cannibal Capitalism. And it's the best definition I've found, and I, I agree with much of the way she defines it. She defines it in the terms of the you know, ownership, private ownership production, wage labor, profit orientation, dominant use of markets. But then she said, and this depends upon exploitation of the unpaid care, the reproductive care in the home. It depends upon the exploitation of the living world. It depends upon expropriating land from racialized people who have been pushed out of this system, as well as exploiting workers within it. It depends on capturing politics. So if anyone's interested in like, I want to really get my head around capitalism, I really recommend Nancy Fraser's new book because it's really, really helping me to, to unlock capitalism. Anybody else? Want to talk about? <laughs> It's quite it's quite hard to top that. So it's more more, more visual <laughs> like on no. I'd say the, 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 I guess the thing the reference I would add in addition to that in terms of thinking differently is, is the idea of kind of radical social innovation. Is that we don't know what to do always. And that's a really good starting point by saying we, we don't have the answers. So we have to kind of figure out how we're gonna get there and who's gonna who's gonna help on that journey. So I think that, that's really valuable. I think we're, we're a little over time already, so I think that's a great moment. Um, one of the words that Kate used quite a lot in the talk was the word generosity. I think she's uh, exemplified that herself, uh, as have uh, Julie Helen and, and Stefan. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Thank you in particular to the, the, the many people I thanked at the beginning, but Natalie's probably top of that list uh, for making it all happen. Um, Kate didn't want to be paid for anything, but she's done this entirely for free for the trade fair. Um, but we've got a very small thing of uh, community enterprise oh, uh, things from uni, which I will explain later okay. rather than do now. Then it, just to say, if anybody from Manchester remembers the Moss Cider Company, yeah. right? Yeah. That bottle of cider is from what the Moss Cider Company now is, which is High Peak Cider, which is where I, and I may have pressed those apples. <laughs> <laughs> I may not, I don't know. But, um, but it's, uh, yeah, there's three, three, I think I'll He says it. our house is on fire on yeah. the label. So yeah. and, <laughs> and, he's, and, he, and it's a smoke, he's, he's smoked the cider, so there's actually a smoke flavour to give the sense of it. I want, uh, can we all uh, thank Kate in the, uh, in, in the traditional way for her generosity of time and uh, extraordinary ambition for uh, uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.